Hello, I'm V.B. Price. I'm the editor of NewMexicoMercury.com. I'm here today in the Mercury Library to speak with one of our favorite guests uh, on Insight New Mexico, columnist and state senator uh, Jerry Ortiz Pino, who uh, was elected to the state senate in 2005 and uh, continues to serve, and I hope will for a very long time. Uh, Jerry proposed this session, the legalization of marijuana, and uh, was the uh, the major drafter, I believe, of a failed effort to amend the Constitution to increase the distribution from the land grant permanent fund uh, to support early childhood education. I'm always delighted uh, to have this insightful observer of the legislative scene with us in the Mercury Library. Yeah. It's great to be here. I have always enjoyed talking to you. We, we get into stuff that I wouldn't have thought ahead of time that we would get into, so I enjoy it. So I'd like to talk to today about the disappointments of this session and the and the successes of this of the session, which, which there were a number. A uh, few, yeah. Uh, and I'm I'm curious about the sort of the general tone of this thing. You know, I mean, I know 30-day sessions are odd, and yeah. uh, everybody tries to do more with them than they can. And, but this one seemed to me to be particularly somnolent or, or sort of, I don't even know how to describe it. Yeah, we were actually in, in what I would say is a state of suspended animation. We just, we had all of these ideas, and we were kind of waiting for things to break in the house. As you know, the Democratic majority in the House is razor thin anyway, and then two House members, House Democrats, weren't able to make it. So, because of illness, you know, both uh, Representative Ernie Chavez from the South Valley and Phil Archuleta from Las Cruces right. never made it to the session. We kept thinking, well, they'll be there any day, so don't push anything through until they get there, because we didn't have the votes unless they were there. And so it was, I think that contributed to this the slow, leisurely pace. <laughs> we didn't. We didn't really start churning out any legislation at all till the last three or four days, and right. and then what did get through was was not all that consequential. I mean, well, the budget. We had to get the budget out, and that was the main focal point. But beyond that, we we did work on the lottery scholarship. We worked on hospital solvency, right. and uh, you know it's it, it's hard to. To point to a whole lot of, of, of uh, monuments of legislative history that, that were that were made this year, there weren't many. So, what do you consider actually the the major disappointments then of this of this session? I think the 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 failure of the constitutional amendments, and I would say four or five key ones. I had thought going into the session that um, you know the the uh, early childhood programs funded by an increased uh, uh, revenue stream from the permanent fund that would have been you know something really substantive that could have come out of this and i thought that the minimum wage indexing it to the cost of living and putting that into the constitution that so that it couldn't be tampered with that was a great idea i thought my idea to legalize marijuana in new mexico was a great idea and then senator michael padilla had a, the idea of reversing the Public Education Department uh, amendment that we passed 10 years ago or 12 years ago now. And so all of those would have been great ideas, but none of them passed. And one of the problems, I think, is that there were so many of them. Huh. At one point, somebody added up, there were 21 separate constitutional amendments that had been proposed. And just the sheer volume of that work, I think, scared off some of the potential supporters. They might have been for one or two of them, but the thought that all of those might get through. And then when the, the two guys didn't show up because they were ill, that, you know, the way a constitutional amendment works, you have to have an absolute majority of the members. Okay. It's just a majority, but it has, it, not just of those voting or those there that day or those of sound mind and body, <laughs> it's an absolute majority. So you need 36 votes in the House and 22 votes in the Senate, and if you don't have them for whatever reason, if they're sick or they're voting against it or they just take a walk, you don't have it. And and it was clear we didn't have it. We couldn't get... To get anything, any any of these amendments through the House, we needed one Republican to join with the with the Democrats. And we, 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 we just... We couldn't, yeah. 
And with those two missing Democrats, then we needed three Republicans to join. It just wasn't going to happen. Tell us a little bit about the um, uh, the legalization of marijuana. It's a, it's a wonderful idea, I think, and I always have, uh, largely because because it takes uh, so much illegal money out of the whole thing, and it's yeah. also, you know, extremely beneficial to people who actually need it uh, uh, for health reasons. But could you wax on a little bit about sure about your intentions and about what actually happened to yeah. it? As far as marijuana and its potential legalization, I, I am absolutely convinced that it's going to happen. You know, it didn't happen this year, and we'll talk about why. It's going to happen, if not next year, sometime soon. And I think eventually the whole country is... is it, it's so clear that the people are ahead of the politicians on this one. We did some polling, we being the Drug Policy Alliance, for whom I carried the, the marijuana constitutional amendment. Uh, and honestly, we did it as a constitutional amendment for two reasons. One, the governor can't veto a constitutional amendment. It goes straight to the voters. But we also wanted the voters to have a say on something of this magnitude. Yes. And so, you know, for both of those reasons, we thought the going the route of the constitutional amendment made sense. And in preparation, we, we, um, we did some polling, statewide polling, and it showed, once again, what what every other poll has showed is that the the trend is absolutely in the direction of favoring legalization. Okay. Each time the people are polled, the number gets stronger. In our poll, um, eighty percent wanted to, the voters to have a say. Almost eighty percent. I think it was seventy-eight, seventy-nine percent. And then of those, sixty-two percent said they were ready to vote for it right then. They they already favored it without hearing all 62%. the. Sixty-two percent. Yeah. So. It's it 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 it's an idea whose time has come. I I'm convinced, and I think there's there's really four reasons for that. <clears throat> one one of the reasons I I pushed so hard for this this year was we had done a a memorial last year to study the issue more, and it's almost like we don't need to study it anymore. It didn't pass. Yeah. The memorial died on the floor at the end of the session in the sixty day session, but it's almost like well that would have been you know, almost an unnecessary step to take because we know what the people are thinking and we know what the problems are. And the big problem is that the the effort at prohibiting, of using the law to prohibit the, the use of marijuana has failed utterly. It doesn't, it doesn't stop its use. It's more widespread today than it ever was. Um, every teenager in town who wants to have marijuana can find it by dinner time tonight. <laughs> uh, it's just... You know, it's just a farce, yeah. what we're going through. But what it does do is it opens up some real inequitable treatment of people, particularly minorities. Yes. And so you've got uh, uh, Anglo kids who are caught with marijuana and they're slapped on the wrist and sent home. The marijuana is destroyed or confiscated and they're sent home. Hispanic, black, Native American kids don't get the same consideration. A lot of them are winding up losing scholarships and losing jobs and going to jail and having to fight things in court, and having their automobiles confiscated, and all sorts of stuff that goes on in the name of the prohibition, right. which is such a farce, because it's widespread, its use is, is, is uh, you know, more extensive than it ever was, and yet we have this uh, fake crusade against it going on. So the first thing is just that it really is inequitable. The second reason is that it... It actually could be a terrific uh, um, way of reallocating our resources. We're spending so much now on police to catch it, on courts to try it, and on jails to punish it. If we reallocated that, so the police were actually doing something beneficial to society instead of just harassing marijuana peddlers, and the courts were clogged with all these cases, and the prisons weren't filled with these people, we could have quite a bit of, of, a, of, a, of a rededication of our resources to some productive activity, some useful activity, something other than just churning, because yeah, right. that's what's going on now. We're just churning those cases over and over again. Third reason has to do with economic development, and... I was thinking of the medical marijuana thing, and, you know, we, we really do. What's happened in New Mexico, we have a very tightly regulated medical marijuana program. And that that actually is 
is probably pretty good, although it's so tightly regulated, there's a real bottleneck. Um, there are about 12,000 people with the card to buy medical marijuana. There are only 22 producers. Oh, dear. And that's the same number we had when there were 4,000 people with the card. And they're limited. They're capped at 150 plants. Well, the supply is artificially being limited. And what that means is if you get a card today, you can't be assured you're going to be able to buy it from a licensed, certified provider. You have to go out on the street and buy it yourself or grow your own. And that's, you know, talk about a farce. Why do we, why do we go through this elaborate thing and then they have to go out and break the law on the street to buy yeah. it anyhow? So I thought, you know, one of the things we could do with legalization would be to open that up. Uh, I'm not sure exactly why the governor has decided to to crimp it the way she has, but it's not, it's not a it's not an effective way of of controlling potential abuses. Um, I'd like to see a lot more certified uh, marijuana producers, and I'd like to see a, each of them being able to grow a lot more than 150 plants. That, that's a real artificial. Way. If they have a little seedling, that counts as a plant. You know, it'll take many months before that's ready to produce any actual usable marijuana. So. Um, they need to, to do some real restructuring of that whole program. But in the meantime, the thought is New Mexico's highly um, controlled medical marijuana program, unlike California's or some of the other states where it just became a free-for-all, anybody who wanted it could get it, um, gives us the opportunity to do some real study and uh, some research into what are the dosages and what are the strengths and what are the conditions that most that are most responsive to the varying de degrees of, of strength of THC, the active element in marijuana. And there, there's a whole bunch of uh, people just poised to do that research if it becomes legal. But until it's legal, they can't do that kind of research. It, it, uh, it's, it's a peculiarity of our system. So there's a lot of great research being done in Israel and in Canada and in Holland, but not in the U.S., if we made it legal, we could start moving in that direction. And New Mexico, I think, would be at, uh, you know, it's because of its situation, it would really be well situated to be a center for that kind of research. Then there's hemp, which I knew nothing about when I introduced this thing. In fact, we didn't even mention hemp in the original uh, constitutional amendment, but boy, the hemp, the potential hemp industry out there educated me in a hurry. It turns out that hemp is this wonder drug, wonder plant. Wonder plant. They can, the fibers can be used for paper, for fabric. The, the uh, stalks can be used for ethanol. The, the seeds are uh, can be a food, uh, an oil. Uh, Twenty six thousand uses for hemp, really? which I had no idea. No, yeah, and it grows in marginal soils. It grows with very little water. You can get two or three crops a year. It would be a great replacement for alfalfa in a lot of these uh, farms on the east side or so on where they're having serious water trouble and where alfalfa is so water intensive. So we amended the, the Constitution Amendment to insert the words hemp in there because it, you know, there, it is not psychoactive. If you chew hemp all day long, all you get is a mouthful of fiber. You know, you're not going to get any high or any effect at all from it. it it's, it's lost its THC. But it's lumped in in the federal mind with marijuana, and because yeah. it it has that that look, it looks like a marijuana plant. They won't tolerate it. Well, if we legalize, we could begin developing our hemp industry in New Mexico, and one of the states is going to jump in in a big way and get it get it going. And I thought it, the timing was right for us yeah. to do that. Colorado is focusing on the recreational use of the of the active THC uh, parts of the plant. We could focus on the the uh, hemp part of the plant, and, and just really develop a hemp industry here. And it would be a boon to farmers on the west side and the south side of the state where water has become such a big issue for them. The fourth thing is really the, the least important of all of the, the potential tax revenues. Um, you know, because the economic development and the social equity and the reallocation of resources are such valuable things, we, even if we didn't get a lot of tax revenue, it wouldn't, it, I mean, I don't, I don't think that would be a, a, a terrible thing. But it is tantalizing when you see what Colorado was re reaping in the way of uh, increased tax revenues from their marijuana legalization. If we could do that here, the estimates are all over the map. We don't know 
what rate of tax we would charge. We don't know how many people use marijuana. We don't know how much they use. And we, there's a lot of unknowns out there. But, you know, potentially it's, a, you know, get, it begins approaching $100 million of tax revenues a year that we could realize from legalizing oh, marijuana. Well, depending on how many people yeah, are using it, yeah, sure. but the estimates from those who use it are very high, and from those who don't use it are very low. Oh, yeah. But uh, so, so we wouldn't know until we really implement, it. and that's Colorado's experience too. They ran out of marijuana in Colorado right away. You know, they, the ah. demand was so enormous they ran out. Tax revenues are just pouring in; they're breaking the bank. Of course, one of the dilemmas that Colorado has created is they. They put the tax at 25% for the, for the, like a sales tax, a gross receipts tax. And that's high enough, and, and the fees they're charging the growers and so on are adding to the cost, that they're, I think they, they, they're, they've been undercut by a black market. You know, they haven't, wow. you've got you've to peg your, your yeah. price, your, your ultimate uh, delivery price yeah. to, the, to the user low enough that, that there wouldn't be any incentive for somebody to keep importing illegal marijuana and selling yeah. it. So that's the, we can learn from what's going on in Colorado. Right. And by the time we're ready to do it, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll have uh, that experience under our belt. We can build on that. So how are we going to approach this thing in the 60th session next year? I was struck by how many Republican uh, senators uh, came forward to say, I would like to see us do it. I didn't want to vote for it because it was a constitutional amendment. And I thought we had to wait a while. But let's start working on it right now for next year, especially this hemp thing. Uh, Senator Cliff Pirtle from Roswell was all over this idea. No uh, Senator Ingle, you know, uh, from Portales, who's a farmer out there. He, th anybody in the agricultural industry realizes this is potentially a gold mine for, for farmers. They need to convince the governor whoever the governor is. Yeah. Now, if Susanna's reelected, you know, she's on record as opposing legalizing marijuana. But at least hemp they could open the door to. Sure. And maybe, you know, if we made it a big issue in the election, whoever the Democratic nominee is, if they would just pick this banner up and run with it, um, the governor might start changing her tune when she starts seeing the way the public responds to that kind of, a, of an issue. Uh, I'm convinced that it's a winning issue for the Democrats. I was hoping it would be on the ballot as a constitutional amendment, of course, but even if it's not, it can still get the voters out if our candidate really made a big deal about it. Sure. And if Susanna still wins, but she sees that this is where the public is, she'll run to the head of that line, I think, and, and, and be willing to, to sign a bill that we got to her if it wasn't, uh, you know... Uh, Utterly crazy bill, something that you know that she could justify. So I'm hopeful that we'll have a bill next year. Well, now we've gotten into the governor's race. Uh, we've, as you know, the Mercury has interviewed all five oh, um, good. Democratic candidates. Yeah. I'm wondering what your view of these guys is at the moment, and if you have a sure. if you have a horse in the race. Um, I I actually am supporting Howie Morales. I I encouraged him to. To run, I, I I had hoped he would get in a lot earlier than he did. I think he's handicapping himself by starting as late as he did. But I, you know, I've watched him as he meets with constituents. We had a fundraiser for him at our house, and just an opportunity for people to meet him. And he connects with people in a way that, um, you know, just gives me great confidence that if if he has enough time, he can be a real winning candidate. He's not as well known as most of the others. I think he's probably the least known, even even less well known than Alan, um, um, Alan Weber. Yeah. Um, but I, but I do think that uh, if he's the nominee, he would be the one who'd be the most likely to, to to put pressure on the governor to respond to some of the issues. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, his first of all, he's a teacher. He's got, uh, you know, a real, uh, a real knowledge of that field, and he's got a passion for for the environment. That coming from Silver City is is kind of refreshing. Yeah, sure. Um, so, I, I mean, I think in a lot of ways he has the potential to 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 bring the Democratic constituencies together in a way that that could get the turnout up. That that's the key to defeating the governor. The only way the Democrats are will beat her is if we have a turnout. Something like what we have in a presidential year, 
And last time we didn't, and we, we paid the price. We could lose the House this time if we don't have a good turnout. We really absolutely need to have a strong candidate out there. They're all good people. I mean, I could I could see myself voting for all of them, yeah, all the Democrats. Um, I'm I'm uh, you know most impressed with Howie. Uh, I like Alan Weber's ideas, and he's certainly you know uh, you know well financed, and that's going to be a problem for Howie as well. Um, the dilemma with Alan is you know uh, Anglo from Boston running against a Hispanic yeah. woman, incumbent. It's an uphill battle, yeah. and it's going to be tough. Uh, I worked for um, uh, Lawrence Rael. I know him really well, and I could I could be you know involved in his campaign and 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 uh, be real supportive if he gets the nomination. But I just because I had encouraged him to run, I've I've committed to Howie, and I think he's got a good chance too. Um, Linda Lopez and um, uh, Gary King, uh, excellent candidates. I I just think right now that Howie of them all has the the best chance of of unseating Governor Martinez. So speaking of Silver City, this leads us to the copper rule and uh, uh, all kinds of <clears throat> nasty stuff about water and the uh, confirmation of Ryan Flynn. The New Mexico Environmental Law Center calls oh. him the, uh, oh, yeah. the uh, gave him the uh, the Toxic Turkey Award mm -hmm. because apparently he uh, he wrote the copper rule uh, almost exactly as the copper industry wanted it to be written. Why was he confirmed? Well, you're, you're actually asking the right person about that because on the rules committee, um, I was the deciding vote that sent it to the floor. On the floor, he, he, he had, I think he only had 10 votes against him on the floor. Um, and it was a tough, a very tough decision because um, all, the, all the testimony leading up to, to the vote from small farmers from Hispanic village people, you know, Asakia uh, associations and so on, from Native American communities, was that this was the most approachable, the most open-doored, the most willing to sit down and talk secretary that they had had at that department in ever. Wow. And, um, and he comes across that way too. I mean, he had met with each of the members of the committee in advance. I think he probably met with every senator you know, uh, in advance of his of his confirmation hearing, just asking, you know, well, what, what are your questions? What can I tell you? And I brought up the copper rules with him, and of course that was the main focus of, of the testimony that was against him that day. Cause, um, and, and I think, you know, what I wound up trying to balance it out is that here's this, here's this young man with, with tremendous potential. He's incredibly bright. He seems to have motivation. Those copper rules, the uh, um, he contends, they're still our our legislation is still better than any of the surrounding states, even though it was seriously uh, watered down. Isn't the right word, I yeah, guess. It's good. Yeah, it's good. seriously, uh, uh, you know, eroded. Yeah. Um, but but I and I think it was a mistake. And I told him, you know, I think you made a real mistake. But but. Uh, you know, I hope you won't uh, have other mistakes like this because you've got great potential. But if you if you keep listening only to, you're not the secretary of, of economic development. Yeah. You don't have to be making these decisions on behalf of industry. Right. We have a department that that does that. You're supposed to be making decisions for the environment. And, you know, and he kind of grinned. And I mean, I I think ultimately he's going to prove to be a good Secretary of Environment. I hope so. And he promised us after his confirmation that he would make sure that we didn't rue the day that we had voted for him. He came up to several of us that had reservations about him. Um, I still have nightmares about that, you know, uneasiness. It was a mistake that he made. I mean, I think it was a genuine mistake. Um, I'm hoping he doesn't repeat that in, in the future. But only time will tell. We'll find out, yeah. Well, as we're talking about water, we might as well get into that 89 mm -hmm. million bucks that was uh, appropriated for all kinds of water projects, including mm -hmm. a science panel uh, to look into the Kirtland Air Force Base, 24 million gallon jet fuel spill. Are you happy with that amount of money? Are you happy with the panel idea? This is one of the issues that we actually talked about with uh, 
uh, Secretary Flynn. Th there just has not been a sense of urgency about that spill. And it's, it's just dragged on and on and on. And they have not... You know they have not done any remediation yet. I know. It's 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 like, uh, how do you get their attention? So that they're taking this step, maybe that means they're going to have you know some ideas generated. Because I think flat, frankly they don't know what in the hell to do. They're they're really scared about uh, about the potential uh, for ruining our water supply. Should we, be. <laughs> we can cap up those wells there. But then you've got the other wells have arsenic in them, and those are the wells, the ones that would be capped, would, are the ones they use to blend in with the water, and the other ones to bring the arsenic levels down to accept. We've got a lot of lot riding on them getting serious about that, and um, you know the the how much money? Well, the feds should be paying the tab on Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Absolutely, they should be paying the tab, and. Um, you know, we just got to stay on top of it. If they have the scientific panel and they come up with some remediation plans, it'll be worth it. If they just study and study and study and stick the studies on the shelves, it's just another delay in, in what we really need to start doing. But what we need to start doing is, is a really good question. They've been pumping the fumes out of the ground, but that's, that doesn't deal with the, the stuff that's no. already in the plume that's already in the uh, groundwater and heading toward our, our well. And that stuff is carcinogenic to the, you know, to a terrible degree, and 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 we would have no choice but just to cap those wells off. Now the Albuquerque Bernalillo County Water Utility, they just keep saying, "Oh, we're on top of this. We're monitoring it. We're watching it," but they're not doing anything about it. And the Air Force should be footing the bill on that, and uh, somebody's got to hold their feet to the fire. Sure. It's for the Environment Department. We said that to, to uh, Ryan Flynn, to the new secretary. You've got to get get on top of that. And he said, yeah, we're going to be working on it. Well, we'll see. He is a reserve officer in the Air Force, and that was something that was brought up. You know, well, how can he... He works for the Air Force. How can he pressure them? In some ways, it may make it easier for him to pressure them. As the Secretary of Environment, he won't be a reserve officer. I mean, he's not wearing that hat when he's doing this. So maybe his knowledge of the Air Force and the, and the uh, protocol and the chain of command and all of that will make it more likely that he gets something done. As we know, this, this jet fuel spill is, is probably the largest in the history of the country. We also know that virtually at least 40, probably 90 Air Force bases around the country have jet fuel spills. We know that that just to get a half a million gallons out of the ground in Victorville, California, Georgia Air Force Base, which is now decommissioned, has taken 30 years and 150 some odd million bucks. I think this is going to cost billions of dollars, and uh, and it is it is very very threatening to almost you know I mean that's the sweet spot of our aquifer. Mm -hmm. So, do you think the governor um, uh, will pass this water panel? This uh, science panel. I mean, will she let it go through, or is she going to play games with it uh, because because of Mayor Barry and uh, the Republicans now in charge of the city? Yeah, that that it'll be very telling as we watch how this plays out, and we'll know that over the next two weeks. She's got to sign those uh, uh, pieces of legislation or make vetoes on, on on something like this if she doesn't want that panel to go through. I, I think she does want that panel to go through. I think they're desperate. I think that, uh, you know, when they're not in front of the TV cameras and when they're not, uh, you know, speaking for the benefit of the press, they're scratching their heads. What the heck are we going to do about this? And so this scientific panel is their effort at finding some group to come up with uh, salvation for them. I. And if she if she vetoes it, then we're you know we we know we're in real big trouble, and we got to do something totally different. Um, th they've hesitated to make it a Superfund site, yeah, yeah. and I think that 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 there's something that if you do that, you have to wait two more years. But we've waited more than two years already. You know, I mean, uh, that would at least unleash some federal money that that's desperately needed to start the work. They're going to have to pump out water. Oh. They just have to pump out all of that water contaminated and, and then figure out a way to separate out. It's, it's like the Gulf spill. It is. You know, the uh, uh, BP spill in the Gulf of Mexico. How do you 
clean all this petroleum out of what what's a, in our case a drinking water supply, in their case a seafood producing supply. How do you do it in a way that uh, that, that that makes it possible for life to go on as before? They've got to have you know some uh, filtration systems or reverse yeah reverse osmosis. I three years ago I said to Mark Sanchez. Should we buy a reverse osmosis filter? It would be fifty million dollars. He he estimated, and but but let's devote the money to it. This is so important. We can't. Oh no, we have other ways. Of, and they're nothing. They they haven't done anything about it in the meantime. And if you ask them specifically, what are you doing? Well, we're monitoring it. Well, that's not the same thing as doing, doing something. <laughs> It's like, well, we're watching the trains collide, and we'll be able to tell when... No, you can just watch the explosion. You don't need to <laughs> to monitor the train wreck. You should fix the tracks or do something. Stop the trains. <laughs> it doesn't seem that this session was a, a huge triumph for early mm -mm. childhood education or for problem readers or for mm -hmm. any kind of... Uh, those kind of really important things. Uh, and I'm wondering what happened. Well, in some ways, th there were some advances uh, through the general budget. The general budget is up now to 6.2 billion. That's where it was when we had the, the when the bottom dropped out of the economy back in 08. So it's taken us five years, six years to recover. That's a long time to slow. But our budget had dropped down to 5.1 billion. So it's taken five years to get it back up. A billion dollars higher to where it was before we lost all that money. We didn't feel the full effect because we had about a half a billion a year from the the stimulus, the federal stimulus money that cushioned it. But in terms of general fund, we went from 6.2 to 5.1 billion, you know, over the over the, the the first two years of that, and then it's just slowly coming back up. So this year we're back at that level. What, me, what, what, what that means is that we've been able to, in the, in the budget, that, and I'm assuming the governor will sign it, I'm sure she will, um, we've been able to, to put some more money into the early childhood programs, and we've been able to put some more money into the reading, especially the K-3 uh, summer reading program that, that tries to identify high-risk readers and ones that really are falling behind and give them some extra special attention and bring them up to speed. So we're doing that. What what we didn't get done, of course, was the 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 injection of a hundred million dollars a year from the from the revenue that's generated by the permanent the land grant permanent fund into early childhood programs. That would have been a terrific boon. I mean, when I say we we've increased money, we're we're increasing money to the tune of fifteen or twenty million dollars here or there. You know, it's it's sizable. I mean, I don't want to say $20 million is anything to sneeze at, but it's not $100 million, and that's what, what that capital, that um, constitutional amendment would have generated. We would have had, uh, you know, some real substantive increases in funding for home visitation programs and, and the early childhood programs that, that, that pay off in the long run. And this is where this is where the same committee, and this time we didn't even, we had two votes in the Senate Finance Committee for the amendment, just two positive votes. Wow. Morales and Rodriguez voted for it. Everybody else voted against it, including two members who had voted for it previously, Campos and Cisneros. Wow. And they both said they, theirs was a protest vote because of the way John Arthur Smith had been treated. Well, what? I mean, this is this this is taking things to a new level. I mean, if you can't criticize the, the people in positions yeah. of influence for not doing a good job, what's the point of democracy? You know, we, we don't go up there to be, you know, uh, inoculated against any criticism. That's the, I mean, when has that ever been the criterion for <laughs> for public service in this state? If you if you don't do something that the people want you to do, you ought to be criticized. Sure. And so anyhow, those two guys voted the other way because of that. We wouldn't have the votes anyhow. It would have been, um, instead of 8 to 2, it would have been 6 to 4, but still a loss. Yeah, it is a loss. One of the things I think that everybody was kind of looking at, if they were looking at anything at all, was the, was, uh, uh, the so-called Omarine Law. Uh, why did that not go through, do you think? 
Well, I, I think the bottom line is it was a, not a clearly thought out bill. I mean, I, I, this was a Representative Ken Martin, Kenny Martinez's bill, and, and he was real upfront about the fact that he was laying in bed you know, thinking we got to do something about these poor kids that are dying. And, and so his bill was just going to, there was going to be no discretion. If the kid had a cigarette burn or a bruise or a bite mark or any physical evidence, you had to remove the kid for two days, a minimum of two days. Now, the dilemma there is that the state already has the authority to remove a child who's genuinely at risk. Right. I mean, there's no there's no question that the state can intervene to, but to do it on that kind of a, of a, of a uh, zero tolerance basis right. just opens up all sorts of potential problems. They don't have enough foster homes for the kids they have now. So what you'd be doing would be pulling kids away from their families. The kid could have been injured playing football or fallen off a skateboard or had any kind of household accident that could have, and you know, to just give this kind of no discretion. You know, what they do now is they'll have a doctor examine the kid, and the doctor gives a considered opinion. Now, this broken bone is, is a spiral fracture. It's not the kind of fracture that could happen from a skateboard accident or football or falling off a tree or whatever. This is something that was, you know, done to the kid. He was hit with something. You've got an uh, informed opinion. Yeah. But just if the kid has a break to pull him out of the house for two days... That didn't make a lot of sense, and so I'm glad that bill didn't go through. Nevertheless, we still have this huge problem, and that is that the Children, Youth, and Families Department is in a total downward spiral. It, it, is, it is not able to do its job. It's not able to, do the, to fulfill the mission for which it was constituted to protect the kids of the state, and it can't because they currently have 16 to 20 percent vacancy rate in the protective service division, not in administrative or secretarial jobs, yeah. but in the workers who are going out there to knock on these doors and find the omeries of this world. So they don't have time to recruit foster homes. They don't have time to do any of the work. And the supervisors who should be overseeing the situation, they're busy handling cases because the worker that used to handle that caseload has quit and fled the state in, in despair. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 and so the, the supervisors are so busy handling cases, they don't have time to supervise, which means the new workers coming in don't get any supervision. They leave faster than ever. And they're hiring people, but they leave as fast as they hire them. So it really is an organization in decline. And, I, you know, they keep coming back with, they, we just need tougher laws for parents who do these things. No, we need better trained workers who can intervene more effectively. In large numbers of them. And a lot of them. They've stopped hiring social workers. They're hiring bachelor's degrees in any field and and people who aren't really prepared for the work. They don't have a training academy. They they just, you know, hire somebody and send them out there. And it 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 really is an organization in decline. And and I I, I just think we've got to do something serious about changing the leadership, but also putting some additional money into it. Now, the problem is they turned back $6 million last year. What is that about? So you say, well, you need more money, but you turned back $6 million, so if we gave you 8 would you turn back 8 or will you spend any of it, you know? They could, they could recruit foster families. They could, they, maybe they should contract for that. I don't know. They've got to break out of the cycle that they're in right now because it's just getting worse and worse. And the worse it gets, the more workers leave, and then that makes it worse, so more workers leave. It's just a total spiral downward. And the kids are in jail. And the kids are the ones that are, that are being left in dangerous situations. Or alternatively, are being pulled from homes unnecessarily because that's just as bad. Yeah. You know, I have friends who... who, who fought with CYFD for two or three years over uh, uh, allegations that they had abused their kids, and the doctors, you know, testified, no, this isn't abuse, this is a brittle bone condition or whatever. And, you know, and it took two or three years to get the kids back. Oh, God. And then there were other kids who really were in abusive situations. But there's, you know, that, that trained discretion, judgment is just not there uh, enough, I think. 
And so they they overreact or they underreact. And and I'm not sure of the two which is worse. Yeah. And then a lot of the foster homes are burdened. You know, if you put five or six kids in a home that really should have had two at most or one ideally, uh, they're not going to do as good a job. And so the kids get neglected or abused in the foster home. What's the, <laughs> what? How have we gained anything at all for the for the children of this state by doing that? So Omari's law didn't pass. I I, I didn't shed any yeah. tears over it. Uh, I think it was a, a too simplistic an yeah. approach, and and it, and it it was one of those zero tolerance things. Like any kid who brings a gun to school, we I mean, suspend yeah. them. Yeah. And so a kid who brings an eraser shaped like a gun, or a kid who brings a a piece of cheese that he's gnawed into the shape of a pistol. Or, you know, all of those kids suspend them all. That's the kind of thing you get when you try to do this black and white thing. And that was my feeling about that, Bill. Right. Yeah. But we need we need some resources in there, and even more than resources, we do need a change in leadership. I'm afraid the secretary is not up to the task. She's a very nice lady. I, I, I you know, I've had conversations with her, but. She's in over her head. Uh, Secretary Dines, uh, Yolanda Beruman Dines, yeah, and you know, she she had never been in a, in, in a child protective service organization before. She was put in charge of this one, and this one is a big one, and it's in disarray, and it's just getting worse. So, as you know, uh, Senator Keller uh, uh, wrote an op-ed uh, that appeared in the Journal a number of weeks ago, and also I think in the New Mexican Early Reporter. In which he, uh, he he enumerated the some nine hundred thousand dollars of appropriated money that hasn't been spent uh, in various agencies in the state. Mm -hmm. The question arises: Is this a executive branch decision to punish Democrats uh, <laughs> and their constituents by not supplying services? Is it a is it a hate government uh, scheme to uh, to to underfund uh, uh, state agencies, what is what is going on? Uh, I mean, why why does uh, CYFD return six million dollars when they have these hideous problems that could be solved with with not only money, of course, but you know, certainly they doesn't hurt. Effectively, yeah. yeah. I I can't I you know I can't fathom it because it really is not just one department, but it's across the full spectrum of of this administration. The vacancy rates are high. The number of fully budgeted, unfilled positions has never been as high as this. And so I've got to believe there is a deliberate attempt to slow down the the process of filling these vacancies and of deliberately trying to send back surplus money at the end of the year so that there is no pressure to ask for more in the coming year. It's in a deliberate attempt to hold on government spending, I believe. Because I can't figure it out any other way. It doesn't make sense. But what it means is that CYFD doesn't, isn't able to do its job. The Department of Health isn't able to do its job. Aging and long-term services, it does adult abuse and neglect, isn't able to. None of them are able to do their job because they're understaffed. And they've got positions. They just aren't hiring them fast enough to get them into the position of doing the job. Um, PED, the Public Education Department, something like 20, and it's not a big department, but they've got, you know, like 20% vacancies in that department. Wow. That's, uh, you know, so even as they're, as they're um, taking on more centralized responsibility into PED, the below-the-line kind of funding that, they, that, we're, that a lot of the battle was, was over this year, they don't have enough people to do the work. So the money doesn't get out. It doesn't get spent effectively. It, the contracts aren't let. The evaluations aren't done. The... The contracts aren't monitored, it, and it's just because they're they're understaffed. Um, I I think there's a certain element of incompetence there too, but I think there's deliberate deliberate attempt to slow down government, shrinking it to the size where it could be drowned in a bathtub. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I I just I, I I can't fathom what's going on otherwise because it doesn't make any sense, and then you have the Human Services Department generating such surpluses this year that they could spend twenty million on those behavioral health contracts. They they just got a BAR, 
They brought it to the LFC. The LFC said, that's not a good justification. Thank you. And they went ahead and did it anyhow, because that's, uh, you know, we don't really have, we have review, but not uh, uh, authority over it. So they went ahead and adjusted their budget. And then this year, they came to the legislature, and they, they had only, they asked for $20 million less in the Medicaid budget, state money in the Medicaid budget, because we don't need it. Now with the Affordable Care Act, there's so much federal money we don't really need. And then they didn't have enough to take care of the yes. hospital solvency problem. So they're, they're going to the counties and twisting the county's arms to kick in one-eighth of a cent from the gross receipts tax for indigent care. None of it makes sense. It's just, it's just like a like a, uh, a really bad movie that, you know, that was there a missing scene there? Because, <laughs> you know, how did they get from on the cliff down here, you know, running the rapids? I mean, it, it, there's something missing. And, and that's what's going on, I think, in, in human services department. It doesn't make any sense at all what they're trying to do and why they didn't ask for the... If they just said flat budget, just give us the same amount of money as last year, everybody would have said, wow, what thrifty, careful stewards of the public wheel. This is great. But instead, they asked for twenty million less, and now they're trying to squeeze twelve million out of the counties. I know. And there was absolutely no need for it. I, 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 you just scratch your head and say, "What in the world is going on?" A lot of it is incompetent. Some of it has to be delivered. So I think you know. Really, this is what happens when you have a bunch of government haters running government. Uh, you hire people who don't have any experience, but you, you know, you you have already enumerated, you know, a long list of people like that. I wish you'd do that for our audience. Well, and it's not just, um, it's not just that they, they hate government, but they're not from New Mexico. They were imported from Florida or Texas or Arizona or some other state. And they're just not up to the job of running these big departments. That first secretary of the health department, uh, Dr. Torres, she left after, I think, a year and a half or two years. And has been replaced by somebody who's a lot better, but she had no more idea of how, I mean, she came, she was a private practice pediatrician, and they put her in charge of the largest department of state government, and she just proceeded to run it right into the ground. She was trying to run it like she ran her her pediatric office, you know, and it just, it can't work that way. You've got to have people with some background in the field, and ideally, people who know what they're doing. But you bring in a Hannah Scandera to run education, doesn't know the field, doesn't I've know the state, and has never been in a classroom. Yeah. Doesn't know the state of New Mexico, came from Florida. We're very different from Florida. What worked there, or may have worked there, now we don't even think it's all that successful in Florida, almost guarantee won't work here. Yeah. And um, uh, Sydney Squire came from Texas. I think she'd been in Florida earlier than that. She knew food stamps. That was it. So they put her in charge of Medicaid, and they put her in charge of behavioral health, and they put her in charge of TANF, and all this other. She's in over her head. And, you know, if she doesn't have a nervous breakdown, she just cannot get things done. And, and you know, Broom and Dines, the same thing. A nice, very good social worker, I'm sure, you know, with terrific people skills. But to run a department, that's a major administrative nightmare and and she just hasn't been up to it and and it and it's now it's starting to all pour out the irony is that the governor to go back to o Marie now oh. the governor who ran for office on the baby brianna case and on her prosecution oh. of the people that killed that child is running away from o Marie, is refusing to admit that she has any responsibility or could do anything about it she says the cops, the DA, somebody else, the parents, they're all to blame. Not me, not my department, not my administration. But it happened on her watch, and we dropped the ball. It's pretty clear that we dropped the ball in that case. And she's not taking any... The buck ain't stopping here. Yeah. yeah. Well, this has been just a fascinating, <laughs> fascinating discussion. I want to ask you just one more thing. I want to talk a little bit about the lottery scholarship, because yeah. yeah. uh, that seems to be a, a success here, and... In one way or another, and yeah, and uh, and uh, we'd like to sort of end on a higher note, possibly. Actually, I think the lottery was one of our best um, pieces of work this session, and it and it brought together Republicans and Democrats, the House and the Senate. They all had their fingers in the pie, 
and it really did come together. The big problem with the lottery has been that the source of funding we identified for it, which was the lottery revenues, has been flat. Right. Meanwhile, tuitions have gone up. There aren't that many more students using it. It's That's not grown incredibly. It's grown slightly. But the amount being spent on tuition is exorbitant. And and largely UNM is, to dri is the driver of that. Uh, over, I think, 60% of all the lottery scholarship recipients go to UNM. Okay. And so all the rest of the schools together, about 40%, UNM about 60%, and UNM's tuition is the highest in the state. So one solution for the lottery is to get people to go to other schools besides UNM. <laughs> but UNM has, you know, in some ways gamed, gamed the, the, the system. They've raised the tuition as much as they possibly can, knowing that a lot of students would get the lottery, and they've used that. I, don't, I mean, that probably make a good administrative decision, but when that happens, then we, we started running out of money. Yeah. So we put $10 million in last year from the general fund to try to keep it propped up. And they said, well, find a fix. We're not going to keep putting more general fund money in unless you fix the program. The problem is the program is so simple and so elegant and so yeah. really fair. Yeah. You know, it's not based on merit. It's not based on need. It's not based on... Um, uh, you know, any kind of differential. It's just a very fair system. You keep your grades up, you got the scholarship. So we, I think the big success is that we didn't change the outline. We didn't inject any of those other concepts into it. What we did do is put some more money into it. And then the House made an amendment that said, um, uh, we have to, re they put it like a two-year sunset clause, so it has to be re-examined re in two years. I would have favored five, but they, you know, at the end of the session, you you can't say no to these things because it threatened the whole thing. So we we agreed to that. We concurred with that. So we'll come back, but for two years it's solid. We put in ten million from the general fund again, and then another ten million from the liquor excise tax. So that's nice to see our our beer money, <laughs> and 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 students have to, you know. <laughs> have a six pack over the weekend they're they're helping pay for their tuition i think it's uh, that's all to the good but uh one of the things they did do is the, the one change they said is if you're going to unm you have to take 15 hours if you're going to unm new mexico state or or tech you have to take 15 hours the other schools the community colleges can get by with 12 i think that's really good we need to have some incentive for 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 more students to go to cnm you know, CNM has is about as big as UNM in terms of enrollment, but in terms of lottery scholarship, only about a thousand CNM students get the lottery scholarship. Okay. There. I didn't know that. Yeah, and if 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 uh, let's say of the ten thousand that get it for UNM, if if eight thousand got it and three thousand got it at CNM, that by itself would save so much money that the that the solvency would, would could be extended for a couple of years. You know, it would really help a lot. If more kids went to CNN, I think they'd get a better first year experience too. I mean, if they're valedictorian of their class, that's a different matter. But if they're, yeah, they got a 2.0, you know, they, they, they got in be, because they they took business math as a senior or something, and so they made it. But they really aren't ready for UNM. Why, why go there and flunk out? Yeah. Why not start at CNN? Smaller classes, more individualized attention get those first couple of years at the smaller school, then transfer to UNM, all your grades, all your, uh, you know, uh, classes transfer, your credits transfer, mm -hmm. and, and, and you can graduate on, on time. But that 12 hours, I think, is another big help, because then if they have to work or if they have, if they take a remedial course that there's no credit for, they can still fill it in. You know, this has been one of these, uh, one of these educations. It's been just great. You, you really... <laughs> Really, I think, opened our minds to a lot of things. I know you opened mine up, and thank you so very much for being here. I hope we can do it again. Well, I, I always enjoy these conversations. I always like talking with you, uh, Barrett, so whatever, whenever. I'm yeah. always eager to come in. Thank you so much. <laughs>